Good afternoon, and welcome to the CE Learning Library webinar, The Mediterranean Diet and the Immune System, What Are the Potential Effects? I'm Leslie Sine, Director of Professional Development at Great Valley Publishing, publishers of Today's Dietitian, and I'm your host for today's webinar. Before we get started, I have the usual points of housekeeping. First, to claim your credit, you'll have to stay with us for the entire hour-long presentation. Second, at the end of the session, our speaker will be taking questions. If you have a question, please type it in the question box in your control panel on the left-hand side of your screen. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can. The faculty and planners for this educational activity have no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. And an eligible company includes an entity whose primary business is producing, marketing, selling, reselling, or distributing healthcare products used on or by patients. And finally, in support of improving patient care, Great Valley Publishing Company is jointly accredited by the ACCME, the ACPE, and the ANCC to provide continuing education for the healthcare team. This activity, of course, awards credit for dietetics. Today's webinar is brought to you with support from the National Honey Board, an industry-funded agriculture promotion group that educates consumers, healthcare, and food service professionals about the benefits and uses of honey. The vision of the National Honey Board is to inspire a passion for honey and an appreciation for the honeybees that make it possible. For more information, visit www.honey.com. And now I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar speaker. Christine randazzo Kirshner is a GI expert dietitian and the co-founder of Amenta Nutrition, a virtual nutrition counseling and consulting firm. Although she helps people with a variety of health concerns, she specializes in digestive disorders, including IBS, chronic constipation, SIBO, and other gastrointestinal diseases like celiac, NAFLD, and NASH. Christine holds a bachelor's in Italian and a master of science in nutrition from Hunter College. She is a committee member of the Dietitians in Gluten and Gastrointestinal Disorders, DPG, and a member of the Dietitians in Medical Nutrition Therapy, DPD. She's also a Monash University low FODMAP diet trained dietitian and an active member of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics. She loves empowering her patients with accurate information so they are confident about future food choices and not held back by fear or uncertainty. And so with that, I'm pleased now to turn it over to Christine randazzo Kirshner. Welcome, Christine. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Leslie, for that wonderful introduction. I am super excited to be here to discuss the immune system and the Mediterranean diet. So here are the learning objectives for today. I won't read them because I'm sure many of you have seen them already. So as you know, today we'll be talking about the Mediterranean diet and the immune system. The immune system is very complex. It is a large network of organs, white blood cells, proteins like antibodies, and chemicals that work together to protect you. For the purposes of this talk and for time's sake, I will give you a macro overview, and I'll be referring mainly to non-communicable or chronic diseases versus infectious ones. Our immune system is our body's way of defending itself. It's our army fighting against enemies that are trying to enter our bodies. There are two arms of our immune system, the innate or nonspecific and the adaptive or acquired. The innate response is the first line of defense against disease and if effective, may completely eliminate the agent or enemy before the specific adaptive immune response is called on. The innate response also interacts with the adaptive immune response aiding in its activation and modulating the response. So as you can see here, Innate immunity includes the blood-borne immune system and the physical barriers that prevent threats from entering the body, whereas the acquired immune system involves lymphocytes like T cells and B cells. So let's take a deeper dive into these two arms. The innate system, this is nonspecific. It's the defense system you were born with. It's the first line of defense. And it involves barriers that keep harmful materials from entering your body, like your skin, the respiratory tract, and the gastrointestinal or GI tract, um, as well as other defense mechanisms such as bile, stomach acid, mucous membranes, et cetera. If the invader or germs get past the skin and mucous membranes and enter the body, the innate immune system activates special immune cells and proteins like neutrophils, dendritic cells, natural killer cells, proteins like cytokines, um, uh, interleukin-1, interleukin-10, and C-reactive protein, et cetera. Then we have the adapted immune system, adaptive immune system. This is a more targeted defense that's based on memory. For example, a young child can get a virus, let's say the common cold. The first time he or she contracts the virus, the immune system will react, and we'll go over an example of an immune reaction shortly. 
Um, part of the immune response will include remembering this virus for the next time the child gets infected with it. The immune system, quote, adapts based off of this memory slash form experience, so it has the necessary weapons for the next battle. So then the, so then the child gets the cold again, the adaptive immune um, system now remembers this virus and then attacks more swiftly and efficiently. So there are many areas in the body where you can find the immune system, like the respiratory tract or the GI tract, and today I'm going to give an example of the immune response in the gastrointestinal tract. But before we do that, let's look at some architecture. So here we are looking at the mucosa. The mucosa is the innermost layer of the GI tract and a vital part of the immune system. Remember, it was listed as one of the defense mechanisms earlier. So gut mucosa is a highly dynamic structure in which microorganisms, epithelial, and immune cells are interacting continuously. There are three layers, and I know I don't have um, my mouse here, so you can just see there. There's the epithelium, the lamina, uh, lamina propria, and the muscularis mucosa. We're just gonna take a quick look at the first two layers. So as you can see here, the epithelium is composed of different cells, and the next slide we'll, take an we'll look at an example of the immune response so you can better understand their functions. But just to familiarize yourself with some of the functions, especially as they relate to the immune system, let's have a look at them here. The gut epithelium is made up of enterocytes, which separates the body from the outside world. Okay, they are the beige-like colored cells shown here that include the intestinal villi at the end. The other uh, cells I'll be reviewing are threaded throughout the epithelium, the ones listed on the left. Um, and as we know, this is where most nutrient absorption occurs via the intestinal villi. So it's also the gatekeeper, or as I like to call it, the bouncer of the GI tract. It decides like who's allowed in and who's denied, right? So this role involves tight junctions and the integrity of these cells helps determine if larger molecules like an invasive agent will be able to slip through or not. It is also where antigens um, are taken up. This is part of the memory function of the adaptive immune system. And disruption of this barrier may lead to chronic intestinal inflammation like uh, that's seen in some diseases like for example, inflammatory bowel disease. Um, okay, so we have goblet cells. Um, you could see here on the key on the left, the goblet cells um, produce and secrete mucin. Mucin is a glycoprotein. It's a viscous, mucus-like, gel-like layer that isn't static. It forms a barrier over the epithelium cells that helps clear, um, like take out some trap material like the invaders. Uh, essentially, they're a protective agent that prevents entry and invasion of microorganisms into the different gut layers, and it's also rich in antimicrobial molecules. Now we have entero uh, enteroendocrine cells. These are hormone producers. They regulate appetite as well as gut microbiota composition and in the integrity of intestinal epithelium. Tana cells produce um, antimicrobial peptides and are responsible for controlling gut microbiota composition. And then we have M cells. M cells capture and translocate microbes and molecules from the intestinal lumen. So these are all the cells within the gut epithelium. Then we have the lamina propria, where at this point in the immune response, the enemy has made its way past the intestinal barrier. Here we find a plethora of immune cells organized in lymphoid tissues known as GALT or um, gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And GALT is associated with an um, epithelial structure that facilitates antigen entry. Um, immune cells that form these galls can include T cells, B cells, dendritic cells, et cetera. It really depends on the threat. So for example, you're not gonna call a swordsman to fight if the opponent has a rifle, right? Um, and in the lamina purpura, we have tires patches. This is where immune detection and response may be assessed. Uh, it's part of GALT. It's a group of well-organized lymphoid follicles that help in identifying antigens and in producing antibodies um, and consists mainly of B cells. And then the B cells, when they're activated and mature, generate the largest population of antibody-producing cells in the body. For example, they secrete immunoglobin A or, or IgA. And then T cells help control intestinal homeostasis and play a role in sustaining barrier function. Um, they're stimulated uh, by antigens in GALT. And then the other um, cells that you can find in the lamina propria can include dendritic cells, macrophages, mast cells, et cetera. They can have pro and anti-inflammatory effects. So the balance of the different types is key to immune homeostasis. Okay, so let's take that little chunk of knowledge that we learned about uh, and go through like an immune reaction. 
I know there's a lot of um, a lot happening on the slide, so I you have that um, key there on the right because I don't have a mouse to kind of walk you through it. So you have dendritic cells um, on the left. You can see that they have that like star starfish shape. These are the intelligence specialists. Okay, so they collect pieces of the invader and present them at the pyres patches to start the immune reaction. So they're collecting pieces um, or antigens rather uh, of the invading of the invader, and they're bringing it to the T cells. The T cells are the immune system communication specialists, and they're located in these pyres patches. This communication um, helps determine the differentiation of T cells. Okay, so you see the pyre patches up purple oval, um, and then that sort of green circle that's underneath it is um, the differentiation of the T cells occurring. And so there are two types. There's Treg and Th17. Th17 produces inflammatory cytokines. They recruit neutrophils and promote inflammation. And this is uh, like a major player in autoimmune conditions. And then you have Treg, which produce anti-inflammatory cytokines like interleukin-10, and suppress activity of immune cells, thus inhibiting the immune response. And it's the balance of these two types of T cells that's crucial for preventing um, excessive immune activation, autoimmune responses, and metabolic syndrome pathogenesis. Okay, so then these T cells activate B cells on the bottom right there, the blue ones, training them to form antibodies. And these antibodies target the invader specifically. Remember, we're now in the adaptive immune response with these T and B cells. B cells release millions of antibodies. They're released until the infection is wiped out or the damage is repaired, and they'll respond uh, even faster the next time. And the antibodies combine to pathogens um, such as toxins to neutralize them. So for example, an antibody combines to a virus, which can prevent it from entering a normal cell and causing infection. Okay. So in a nutshell, this is an example of immune response. Like I mentioned, the type of immune response can depend on a few things, like the type of invader or enemy trying to enter the body, but, can, but it can also depend on the microbes that make up our microbiome. You can see here at the top of the slide in the lumen of the gut there, there are examples of different microbes sort of floating around. Uh, there are also certain bacteria found in pyres patches, and these can help modulate the immune response. So let's um, briefly discuss this interplay. So we know that 70% of the immune system is located in the gut where your microbiome is located, and we know we can feed our microbiome in order to help it thrive. So just a quick, a quick recap, your microbiome is located along the digestive tract, and when I mention that, I'm referring mainly to the colon, where the most abundant amount of diverse microorganisms are living together, ideally in harmony. And this includes the metabolites they produce as well. It's very fascinating. Both your epithelium cells and your immune cells have receptors that can detect, one, which enemies are floating around, and two, the specific uh, gut microbiota that are there. And these two bits of information can influence or help determine the immune system reaction. So they are, therefore, metabolic products from the microbial communities can influence gut homeostasis and immunity. So when your body activates your immune system, it sends out inflammatory cells. These cells attack the invader, like the bacteria, the virus, or they heal uh, damaged tissue. There are two kinds of inflammation, acute and chronic. Acute inflammation is short-lived, where chronic inflammation is longer term. So when we talk about chronic disease or autoimmune conditions, we're referring to chronic inflammation. But let's have a quick look at the two of these. Acute inflammation is the beneficial kind. It's a mechanism of innate immunity. So you think of it as a flaming fire that produces sort of like the red hot swollen symptoms like a cut. When inflammation is acute, it's usually at high levels in this small localized area in response to the infection or some kind of damage to the body. And so it's necessary for proper healing and injury repair. When your cells detect an infection or damage, your immune system sends out many of the white blood cells we reviewed to help fight off invading germs and clean up the damage so you can heal. Symptoms of acute inflammation may need short-term treatment like pain relievers or a compress, or if you have a more serious symptom like a fever or shortness of breath, you may need medical attention. But in general, acute inflammation goes away after the damage is healed, often within days or hours, and again, acute inflammation is the good kind because it does the job 
the essential job it needs to do, and then it quiets itself down. Now, chronic inflammation is different. It's more of the slow-burning and smoldering type of fire. This type of inflammation can exist throughout the whole body at low levels. That means that symptoms aren't localized to one particular area, and instead, um, the symptoms can appear gradually, they can last much longer, months, even years. And this is the, quote, bad kind or damaging kind of inflammation. Why? Because it doesn't quiet down, it's always there. And studies show that reducing inflammation can reduce the risk of several chronic diseases, right? Like heart disease, metabolic syndrome, we know this. And there are medications used to help lower inflammation to treat some of these diseases, like corticosteroids, immunosuppressants, biologics. However, there are also several lifestyle changes, including dietary ones, that can be very helpful to prevent and scale down inflammation and to reduce the damaging effects that it can have on the body. So inflammation is generally beneficial and it has evolved to promote survival, but can also be maladaptive when chronically activated and sustained. Um, and that can, that's what can lead to tissue damage and chronic diseases. Actually, in fact, the world, like the, the slide shows here, the World Health Organization ranks chronic inflammatory disease as the greatest threat to human health. And three out of five people die due to chronic inflammatory diseases, such as the ones listed here. Okay, so now that we have uh, a basic understanding of the immune system, I know that was quick, but I want to get a lot of information in here for you all. So now that we have that basic understanding of that, the inflammatory response, let's have a look at some nutrients and food compounds that may play a role in regulating these responses. After all, I just mentioned that there are diet changes that we can make. So here are some of the key nutrients that play a role in the immune system, and we'll take a mini dive into each of them now. All right, so there's a lot of buzz about anti-inflammatory diets. Uh, the so-called foods that make up these diets are often contra um, contradictory to each other, right? Sometimes pro-inflammatory foods are being promoted as anti-inflammatory. So, like, how do we untangle this mess? You know, how can we guide our patients? Well, with evidence, of course, because that's what we do. And so, to as you can see on the slide here, this is the anti-inflammatory, um, excuse me, the dietary inflammatory index. So to better understand which foods are anti-inflammatory, researchers reviewed like 1,900 studies to determine the relationship between certain food parameters and the six, and six inflammatory biomarkers found in our body. Um, as a result, they developed this beautiful evidence-based validated tool called the Dietary Inflammatory Index. And so each food parameter was given a weighted score based on quantity and quality of the studies. And that score ranges from negative one to positive one. So if it was a positive number, then it was considered pro-inflammatory. If it was negative, it was considered anti-inflammatory. And if it was a zero, it was considered neutral. So I extrapolated some of them for you here. And you can see there's a lot of polyphenols, um, like flavones and flavanols, um, as well as some vitamins, high quality fats, spices, and fiber. So what is the role of fiber? Okay, so like I mentioned, 70% of our immune system can be found in our gut, and we discussed the bidirectional relationship between the gut and the immune system and how the microbial makeup of the microbiome can influence the effects of the immune system. And like previously mentioned, we can eat what we eat can determine the makeup of our own personal microbiome. So one of the best things we can do to influence the microbiota composition is eat fiber. That's, that's why carbohydrates are key. Remember, I went over the microbiome and how our beneficial bugs metabolize the indigestible fibers that we consume, right? They ferment them. Well, we now know that even in as little as 24 hours, changes in our microbiome can be seen. These changes can include microbial composition, intestinal permeability, and bacterial metabolites. And this is one way we can help ourselves and our patients boost their immune system because obviously they can't change their, their genes, but we do have control over our diet. So how much fiber should we be eating? Well, in terms of quantity, we do have the dietary guidelines that you're all very familiar with. Um, this gives us an idea of how many grams per day we should be consuming. This can range from 22 to 34 grams per day. In terms of quality of fiber intake, it's all about variety. So what you're looking at here is the American Gut Project, which started in 2012. The aim of this project, it's still going on, the aim is um, to understand the kinds of microbes and microbiomes that, that are, as they put it, 
quote, out in the wild. Um, at the time of this publication in 2018, more than 10,000 self-selected participants provided stool samples for analysis. And as of today, they looked at about 20,000 samples. So super interesting that they were able to collect all these samples to analyze all these microbiomes. And what they concluded was that the, quote, healthiest microbiome, those with a more diverse microbial community, were associated with people that consume 30 or more different plant foods per week. And, and what does a healthy microbiome look like? Well, here are some of the other commonalities that these individuals' microbiomes had. They identified several microbes that were short-chain fatty acid fermenters. So, so that means that these microbes could, um, uh, one of their byproducts could be butyrate, which can help nourish the gut lining and um, maintain its integrity, essentially preventing, quote, leaky gut, if you will. Uh, the microorganisms were also associated with a reduction in antibiotic-resistant genes. Another detected feature was that, th that these microbes comprised of multiple um, isomers, including linoleic acid and conjugated linoleic acid, or CLA. CLA abundance did not correlate with dietary CLA consumption, as determined by the uh, participants' um, food frequency questionnaire. But CLA is a known end product of linoleic acid conversion by lactic acid bacteria in the gut. Um, so it was the gut bacteria that synthesized the CLA. Why does this matter? Because CLA may help improve immune function. It has been shown to exert various uh, potent physiological functions, functions such as anti-carcinogenic, um, anti-diabetic, anti-hypertensive. Uh, it can be effective to prevent lifestyle diseases or metabolic um, syndromes. So the overarching conclusion uh, like I mentioned, was that those that consume more than 30 plant foods per week had the healthiest, most diverse uh, microbiomes that were made up with good beneficial bacteria. And so this is why a fiber bar or a fiber powder or a supplement is not the end-all be-all. We all know that our patients love a quick fix, but instead um, they really should be eating fiber-rich foods that are colorful, seasonal, and super delicious. We're going to look at some examples later on. Okay. Um, antioxidants have a large role in the immune system. There are different types of antioxidants, non-enzymatic, enzymatic, and nutrient antioxidants. Uh, so what are they? Um, nutrient antioxidants are exogenous compounds. They're obtained from natural foods or dietary supplements, right? So such as like vitamin C, E, carotenoids, trace elements, um, polyphenolic compounds, and they remove potentially damaging oxidizing agents or free radicals in us humans and other living organisms. Essentially, they inhibit oxidation, neutralizing harmful free radicals in our bodies to prevent or delay cell damage. So free radical generation occurs continuously with cells as a consequence of common metabolic processes, right? This is a normal and expected process. However, in high concentrations, whether from endogenous or exogenous sources, free radicals can lead to oxidative stress, which I just mentioned can cause serious damages to molecules in our body and lead to impaired cell functions and even cell death and disease state. Um, and oxidative injuries accumulate over time and participate in you know, cancer development, cardiovascular, neurodegenerative disorders, as well as aging. So part of our immune system includes a complex web of antioxidant defenders, including enzymatic antioxidants like glutathione peroxidase and glutathione reductase, as well as non-enzymatic antioxidants such as melatonin and coenzyme Q. Nutrient antioxidants have um, antioxidant potency to assist in minimizing the harmful effects of reactive species. And the immune system is extremely vulnerable to oxidant an antioxidant balance as uncontrolled free radical production can impair its function and defense mechanism. So like many processes in our body, it comes down to homeostasis. And as you can see on the slide, this these are like antioxidant-rich foods and compounds uh, showing that they can block oxidative stress and the damage that free uh, radicals can cause. Okay, so the role of micronutrients. So this slide highlights the effects various nutrients have on the two parts of the immune system. I'm going to focus on some of the vitamins here. And vitamin A is a micronutrient whose function includes, as you all know, maintaining vision, promoting 
growth and development, and in the case of the immune system, protecting epithelium and mucos, uh, mucus integrity in the body. It promotes mucin secretion and thus improves the antigen nonspecific immune function of tissues. It also blocks differentiation of T helper 17. Remember that was the pro-inflammatory one and can help induce um, immunoglobin A secretions by B cells. Um, some vitamins have antioxidant properties like vitamin C, but vitamin A can influence the immune response in, a highly, in like highly specific ways. And the same goes for vitamin D. Vitamin D exerts an inhibitory effect on several immune cell types like dendritic cells and macrophages. It inhibits T cell proliferation, specifically TH17, again, the pro-inflammatory, and the expression of other pro-inflammatory cytokines, helping to maintain this immune homeostasis. Um, vitamin C um, is the, probably the most well-known antioxidant because, the, because of its capability as an electron donator to reduce damage by scavenging uh, reactive oxygen species, remember ROS. It supports epithelial barrier integrity and accumulates in um, phagocytic cells like neutrophils. So it enhances phagocytosis, generation of ROS, and ultimately microbial killing. And then uh, there's also vitamin E as uh, another antioxidant. Um, it's not listed here, but it um, protects intestinal mucosal, uh, the intestinal mucosa against damage um, from the ROS, the reactive oxygen species, and gives protection to polyunsaturated fatty acid integrity in cell membranes. I know this slide is very busy. It's just showing uh, where in the immune system reaction various nutrients are active. And we're just going to review a couple of um, additional micronutrients. So zinc may be the trace element um, with the most evidence for immunomodulation. It affects multiple aspects of the immune system. It's crucial for normal development and function of cells that mediate the uh, innate immunity, like neutrophils and natural killer cells. Uh, phagocytosis and cytokine production are affected by zinc deficiency. And the deficiency in zinc also adversely affects like the, the growth and function of the, the T and B cells. And lastly, zinc also functions as an antioxidant. Uh, and then we have iron. Iron regulates immune cell activity polarization of macrophages, neutrophil recruitment, natural killer cell activity. In the adaptive immune system, it has an effect on the activation and differentiation of T17 and antibody response in B cells. And the last one I'll mention here is selenium uh, SE. You can see that floating around. Also has redox features. It influences lymphocyte activation and differentiation, displays immunobiological activity when bound to specific proteins and has some special potential in resisting um, viral infections. Okay, the next nutrients we're going to go over are high-quality fats, the MUFA, PUFA, and omega-3. So dietary fatty acids, like MUFAs and PUFAs, have many different effects on the immune system and immune cells. Um, for time purposes, I'm not going to go through all of them today, and I don't have like a fun schematic for you all, uh, but just to highlight a few. Omega-3 uh, omega PUFAs like DHA and EPA, they restore, I'm talking about like the epithelium right now, they restore previous impairment and omega-6s improve intestinal barrier integrity. So the N6, N3 PUFAs, the content, they restore the cellular membranes and the anti-inflammatory effects of um, high-quality fatty acids and also decrease the production and secretion of inflammatory cytokines. However, like the majority of this information comes from in vitro and animal, uh, in vitro studies and animal models. Less is known about the direct clinical relevance of the um, observed results. Several clinical trials uh, investigate the importance of, for example, omega-3 supplementation in epithelium-related diseases in the gut and lungs, such as inflammatory bowel disease and asthma. Unfortunately, these um, studies are rather inconclusive. Um, there are also uh, effects, you know, dietary fatty acids also have effects on macrophages, as you can see here on the slide, dendritic cells, T cells, et cetera. But in general, MUFAs and PUFAs decrease barrier permeability, mucus production, pro-inflammatory cytokine production, and oxidative stress, and they increase tight junctions and healing. Okay, what are the role of polyphenols? Polyphenols are a group of secondary plant metabolites for example, flavonoids, that present antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties with effects on gut microbiota as well. They modulate immune responses in both the innate and the adaptive systems. 
having both um, stimulatory and inhibitory effects in different areas. There are specific kinds of polyphenols that have all their own specific immune system effects like um, hydroxytyrosol, resveratrol, and quercetin. For time purposes, I will not go through all these individually. I also don't want to bore you all, but a few examples of their effects on the immune system are that they decrease um, pro-inflammatory molecules, they boost the growth of beneficial bugs such as lactobacil um, lactobacillus, uh, and then in turn inhibit opportunistic pathogens. The prebiotic effects of these polyphenols um, in relation to beneficial bacteria, they encourage them pr to produce antimicrobials against pathogenic bacteria. Um, they contribute to significant decrease in oxidized LDL and triglycerides, and they have anti-carcinogenic, anti-inflammatory, antiviral, and antiplatelet aggregation properties. Okay, so most of all the information I just went over on nutrients is from animal or in vitro studies. So why not more human studies? Well, it is extremely difficult to show causation based on a single nutrient, right? Number one, nutrients are not found alone. And number two, there are many different nutrients involved in biochemical and immune processes, and they work together. So it's hard to isolate the effect a single one has on, for example, a disease state. Well, then let's focus on specific foods, not nutrients, right? Well, no, because foods are a mix of nutrients, and we have to consider the food matrix, food synergy, plus we eat a variety of foods throughout the day. So how can we tell if that specific food was the cause of whatever it is we're researching? So yes, these are the limitations of nutritional research, as we all know, which is why we focus on epidemiological and observational studies. Within these studies, we look at a population's overall eating pattern to determine potential benefits and health outcomes. And of course, there are other confounding variables that can contribute to health outcomes like environmental factors, genetics, exercise, sleep, and more. So this is why we focus on the overall eating pattern, aka diet. Oh, why do I have that oh there? Well, when you say the word diet, it can oftentimes have a negative connotation for lots of reasons, but especially for people who have, have um, chronically dieted or were or are currently a part of diet culture. So to keep it positive, consider using the term eating pattern instead. Additionally, there is no, uh, contrary to everything you hear on social media and internet and elsewhere, there is no superfood that's going to cure you, nor is one meal going to inhibit all the wonderful work you have put in to nourish your body so well. So it's important to focus on what you're eating most of the time and not hyper-focus or worry about a single food or a single meal because that meal or that food will not change your, your health outcome. And lastly, using the word eating pattern um, may also help the person think of it more as a lifestyle rather than a temporary way of eating. So an unfavorable eating pattern that I'll highlight today is the Western diet, <laughs> which includes higher amounts of salt, fat, um, ultra-processed foods, and lower amounts of fiber. Of course, we tend to think of the U.S. right away, oh, with all the, you know, super fabulous convenience and ultra-processed foods that are marketed as, quote, healthy superfoods. But we do live in a globalized world where cultural globalization has grown, and we're able to influence each other in a very easy and fast way. So it's not just the U.S. that eats this way, but other countries and cultures, including Mediterranean ones, especially amongst children and adolescents. And this way of eating, we all know, can lead to chronic diseases like cardiovascular disease, metabolic syndrome, et cetera. Now, speaking of keeping it positive, um, it's not about what you eat, but what you're not eating. Um, so opposed to thinking about how, quote, damaging, for example, ultra-processed foods can be for your patients or clients, maybe focus the language on how we can nourish and increase the chances of boosting our immune system instead. It's, it's like a mindset shift. Uh, so we're walking away from words like should, for example. So just, just a little sidebar there. Okay, so finally, the Mediterranean diet. What is it? Um, the Mediterranean diet was first introduced by the seven country studies in the 50s when globalization had not started to guide lifestyle and diet. It included southern European populations from countries where all trees grow naturally. And these populations had the longest lifespan with the lowest incidence of coronary heart disease, cancer, and other non-communicable diseases. And as you all know, the researchers were interested to understand what type of eating pattern and lifestyle habits these populations had. So here is a list of the common characteristics that they found amongst the study populations. As you can see, there are food items as well as non-food items. I've highlighted the lifestyle factors that 
many had in common like connection to nature, physical activity, socializing, cooking with others. And then uh, let's take a look now at like the common food parameters that were found in the Mediterranean diet. So here's the Mediterranean diet pyramid. I believe this year is like the, celebrating the 50th anniversary of this pyramid. And what it shows is that the Mediterranean diet is a plant forward diet. Remember that plant foods come from whole grains, seeds, nuts, fruits, vegetables, beans, and legumes. It includes leaner proteins that are also rich in high quality fats like fish. Uh, Mufa rich olive oil is the principal source of fat. And saturated fat is lower as red meat is consumed in lower amounts and dairy is limited. But as you can see, this pyramid did not mention specific foods. Of course, they did mention some food groups. Uh, it did not mention recommended portion sizes or discuss calories and did not talk about specific nutrient contents of food. It's going back to that overall eating pattern. And, and, and of course, at the bottom of the period, you can also see the various um, lifestyle factors at play. I realize that from Ansel Key's seven country study, it's easy to think of only those Mediterranean cultures when thinking of this way of eating. Um, but many of the components of the med diet can be found in various countries around the world and thus can be adapted to a variety of cultures. And we'll see a few examples in a bit. Okay, so common nutrients of the Mediterranean diet eating pattern. As you can see from the slide here, the um, Mediterranean diet is rich in foods that have antioxidant and anti-inflammatory um, activity, such as monounsaturated fatty acids, omega-3s, polyphenols, flavonoids, the list goes on. So um, as you can see, many of the principal nutrients in the med diet are also the ones we just reviewed that are the key nutrients in the immune system. So no wonder this eating pattern has received so much um, attention and accolades. Okay, so we discussed polyphenols and anti-inflammatory compounds in food. Here are some examples of foods that contain these beneficial substances. Um, uh, hydrotyrosol being uh, the main polyphenol in olive oil, for example. I mentioned quercetin, which is found in onions. Uh, resveratrol, which a lot of you know I'm sure are familiar with, can be found in red wine and grapes, that's a flavanol. And then other anti-inflammatory and anti-rich, uh, antioxidant-rich foods, this is just for your, um, for your reference, these are just these uh, foods that are rich in these vitamins and um, high quality fat like omega-3 and my favorite um, best friend there in the bottom right, fiber. Okay, so now some practical applications um, during nutrition counseling sessions. So like, what are some of the things that you can do when you're in session with your patients? So when working with patients, we need to know what they're eating, right? This is part of our assessment. And we do this through um, a food frequency questionnaire or a 24-hour diet recall. And here's an example of one. Now, staying on that let's keep things positive theme, instead of telling your patient to eat this instead of that, when reviewing your patient's um, diet recall, ask yourself, you know, where are those anti-inflammatory foods, those antioxidants? those fiber-rich foods, like how much color is on this person's um, plate? Uh, how can I enrich this person's current diet or way of eating opposed to giving them a whole new regimen? Remember that it's very difficult for patients to change their habits, and quite frankly, they may simply love these foods, and the last thing you want to do as their dietitian is to demonize them or restrict foods for no reason. Um, and, uh, you know, the just looking at this example, honestly, this person is not even eating that poorly. Like, we've, we've all seen worse. So let's take a look at, um, like, the new and improved or enhanced version. Okay. So now we haven't really taken much away, but we're just adding. So, the, for example, the oatmeal berries were a great start, but we can pump it up a bit. Nuts and chia have omega-3s, fiber and proteins, while cinnamon has anti-inflammatory properties. Um, at lunch here, the salad now has more variety with additional vegetables, including artichokes and asparagus that are prebiotic rich fibers, which you now know are so important. Uh, the lentil soup is also rich in prebiotics. And you can see that the snack and the dinner um, were also enhanced with immune boosting nutrients. Okay, remember that the med diet has many uh, faces. I wanted to provide you with a few simple examples of global meals that are also rich in immune boosting nutrients. Uh, so here's four examples, and here are the, all the amazing nutrients that are in, 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 are in each one of these dishes. Um, <clears throat> so you can see here there's different vitamins, minerals, anti-inflammatory food compounds, polyphenols, high-quality mufas and poofas, as well as antioxidant-rich foods in each one of these. 
So let's look at the first one as an example. We have soba noodles with spinach, edamame, shredded cabbage, diced carrots, cucumber, miso dressing, and salmon. Geographically, this is nowhere near the Mediterranean, but it, but it is absolutely a nutritious, delicious option that contains the key nutrients of the immune system and the Mediterranean diet. Okay, and one more other perspective here, the Mediterranean diet does not have to be expensive. Beans and grains are some of the cheapest um, food staples, frozen vegetable and fruit are convenient. And when you pick produce at their peak and freeze them, more nutrients are maintained. Um, these types of unprocessed convenient foods are easy and quick. Uh, here are a few examples. So the idea behind these meals is that most of the ingredients can be found in the pantry and the others may be in the freezer or some basic staples that are often found in the fridge, nothing fancy. And of course, if your patients are using canned goods, we always like to promote low sodium and even rinsing the beans before use, um, before they use them to cook with them. Um, okay, so a quick peek at one of these. Let's look at the shishuka. Um, coincidentally, it was actually on the cover of today's dietitian's um, magazine for the month of May. How funny is that? Uh, shishuka can be whatever you want it to be. It's essentially eggs cooked in tomato sauce, but this one has canned tomatoes, frozen spinach and cauliflower, chickpeas, excuse me, spices and eggs. Um, so canned tomatoes, pantry. Chickpeas, pantry. Spices found in the pantry. Uh, spinach and cauliflower frozen, and eggs are a common staple in the fridge. And you can even make this vegan by using tofu. And then you can see all the nutrients that are included in this meal. So pantry items are a great economical choice and a wonderful, what I like to call, plan B choice when life gets in the way and your meal planning, meal planning has just been like thrown out the window and you don't know what to cook. Okay, so some key takeaways for today and how to start eating a more plant-forward, anti-inflammatory med diet-like eating pattern. Um, you can increase your um, intake of fruits and vegetables and all the wonderful plant foods. Use a plant-based oil as your staple cooking oil. Uh, pay particular attention to foods that are high in a lot of these uh, antioxidant and polyphenols. Uh, make sure to be adding your omega-3 fats through nuts and seeds and fatty fish. Um, remember that the high fiber foods encourage their gut microbes that help reduce inflammation and boost your immune system. We didn't talk about this much today, but avoid charring foods when you can at high temperatures. And then, of course, limit the um, pro-inflammatory foods. Um, of course, if all of if following all this is overwhelming for patients to do it once, which it most likely will be, um, remember to use SMART goals. After all, we are working on um, behavioral changes. Okay, so as you can see, there's a lot of overlap between the common nutrients found in the med diet and the key nutrients involved in the immune system. So it's no surprise that this eating pattern has received so much attention. Remember that um, this is a lifestyle and a way of eating, not a strict, structured, temporary diet. There's a lot of flexibility, fun, and flavor that can be enjoyed. And I know that I zipped through that, but I wanted to make sure I was able to share everything with you all. Um, so with that, I am happy to take some questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Christine. Uh, the chat box is popping in with a bunch of questions, so let's jump in. How do you feel about this statement sometimes made by healthcare professionals? You say one cannot quote unquote boost your immune system. Um, I think like that goes back to sort of like you don't have full control of boosting your immune system. I hope this answers this in a way that makes sense. There are other uh, factors of play, right? There, there are your genes. Uh, there are environmental factors, all, all other, like other, other things that are going to influence um, and determine how well your immune system works. And diet is just one avenue. So um, I think that there's some weight in that, um, but it's not that you're ever going to have 100% control over, over how well your immune system works. Great. Yeah, I think that's perfect. Um, okay. Since you just mentioned some... Um, some pantry items and usage of oils, cooking oils in your takeaway points. One of our listeners asked if you can speak to the use of canola oil and any health concerns you may have heard about canola oil specifically. Yeah, I mean, canola oil is fine. Like that's a vegetable oil, uh, safflower oil, olive oil, um, any of those um, 
are fine. I know there was like a, there's a lot of chat about like seed oils. I mean, a lot of that has be has been debunked, and you know this is where it takes a lot of work on our end um, to make sure that we are up to date. Uh, and, and as dietitians, it's overwhelming, right? Because you have all these patients and clients that are googling every last thing, and so there's a lot of pressure on us to know every last thing. Um, but we know which sources are the right ones to look for, and we're able to extrapolate the latest research. Um, so, you know, when you're in session with a patient like that, like I do myself, I'm not going to know everything. And so if they have a very specific question, um, that's sometimes that I might just tell them that I have to get back to them. Um, but, no, there's nothing wrong with canola oil. Okay, great. Mediterranean diet be 100% plant-based without including meat or fish. Um, I mean, you know, traditionally there was, there is space for meat and fish, um, but like I said, there's nothing strict about it, and a lot of the benefits that have been extrapolated on the Mediterranean diet are all those nutrients that, went, that I went over. So if you're following a, um, I'm sorry, I don't know if you said, did you say vegan or plant-based? Plant-based. Yeah, so if you're following a plant-based diet, um, especially if you're um, following a vegan diet, you just want to make sure that you're organized in such a way that you're hitting all those points, like you're hitting all of those nutrients. So it's not that you need to have meat, um, but you have to be aware of nutrients that you might be missing um, that you can find in other foods and considering the bioavailability of those foods with the nutrients, um, considering high quality supplementation when needed. Um, for example, for vegans, maybe B12, um, and just make sure that you're just being mindful of it, that you're, that you're covering all your bases there. Great. Okay. Um, is there a resource that you would recommend that you typically go back to to learn more about um, supporting the immune system and or, um, you know, uh, following a Mediterranean diet? health uh, eating pattern? Um, webinars? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> That's an awesome <laughs> answer. <laughs> I mean, you know, webinars are, 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 by our Ds are a great resource because they're doing the work for you, right? They're, they're, they're looking into all the research and summarizing it for you. Um, but no, it's the research. Um, that's, that's what you have to be kept up to date with. There are things you can do. You can put keywords, whether it's in PubMed or Google, and, and there are ways that you can kind of have it on your radar that, that you're not always actively looking for it. Um, but once you have a foundation on a specific, whether it's a topic like the Mediterranean diet or um, a specific condition, like, you know, we specialize in digestive disorders, so something like irritable bowel syndrome, once you have that foundation of your specialty or that thing that you want to know more about, it makes it, a, that's, that's like the chunk of the work that takes the most time, and then you can sort of add on to it um, as the new research trickles in, and it won't feel as overwhelming. Um, okay, so Laura asks an interesting one. Do you ever see an increase of triglycerides on people going from another kind of diet? She specifically says keto, but um, going from one diet, switching to the Mediterranean diet. In triglycerides? Yes. Um, have I seen like that uh, specifically with my own patients? Um, I'm trying to remember like right now, you know, we don't, we, I don't look at PAG as often as maybe some other dietitians because, like, the type of work we do. Um, but, you know, it is well known that, that those are the types of values that you can change when you're going more plant forward. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so Chelsea asks, asks one that I think um, will be interesting to a lot of listeners as well. What about the consumption of red wine? Um, the Mediterranean diet doesn't necessarily uh, advocate for an increase of that. Of course, moderation is, is best, but, um, you know, in that region of the world and with your experience in Italy, um, any comments about red wine and how that plays a role in, in health as you follow a Mediterranean diet pattern? Yeah, I mean, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, a little bit of red wine is um, 
at the end of the day, like, I, and I don't want this to come off the wrong way, but like at the end of the day, alcohol is poison. So if you are drinking a lot of it, there's really no benefit to, to it. Um, it doesn't mean that you can't have it in your diet. Um, uh, resveratrol that's found in it, I think you would have to consume a ton of red wine to have those sort of effects. Um, and, uh, and yeah, um, that's really, I think that's really all I have to say about wine. Okay. It's enough. not like it's it's met, metabolized in the stomach. It's not something that's going to go on and help your microbiome or anything like this. So, okay. So yeah, you can't drink a bottle and be like, I'm getting all these benefits of the med diet. No. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Okay, so Krista asks an interesting one. Once you've been following the Mediterranean diet or the eating pattern, as we're going to call it, are there general mm -hmm. and or specific results that patients should be able to note regarding um, possible symptom improvement, for example, increase in energy or um, weight loss? And I know it's a very individualized result, right, based on the patient um, and their individual situation. Um, but anything maybe that you've seen with your patients or um, – results that you know of in the research about following a med diet that you might, patients might look for? Yeah, I mean, following this type of eating pattern um, is going to or can result in better or optimized metabolic function, and that's why it's reducing the risk for a lot of those diseases. Um, in terms of um, energy, um, it depends on the patient, right? That's super individualized. So if we are, for example, um, I have a patient who has like a low intake of fruits and veggies and um, they have like wide gaps between their meals. And so I'm taking like snacking as an opportunity to fill nutrient gaps. And if I'm taking um, produce like a fruit or a vegetable and I'm pairing that with something like, I don't know, a complex carb or protein or something, oftentimes protein, then yeah, that's going to help balance their blood sugar throughout the day. Um, that's going to help their metabolic function, and that's going to keep them even keeled in terms of energy throughout the day. And a lot of times with these patients are missing fruits and vegetables and fiber, which, all, I mean, where all of our patients are always missing fiber when they come at least through our virtual door, um, those, those food stuff, so fiber foods have a lot of vitamins and minerals that are essential cofactors and helpers for a lot of these metabolic processes and, and should uh, theoretically help improve somebody's energy level as well. Great. Yeah, the cause and effect definitely makes sense there. Um, a lot of people are asking questions about coconut oil. Um, do you have any feelings on using coconut oil? Although it's a saturated fat has been shown in various studies as anti-inflammatory. Um, any comment on that? Yeah, I mean, for me personally with coconut, I'm – I'm waiting for more research. Obviously, the chemical structure, it's, it's a saturated fat. Um, the question is, does it work, this, does it, um, you know, function in the body the same as animal sources of saturated fat? Uh, I just would like to see more research on that. So I'm not, currently I'm not standing here on stage with a megaphone uh, promoting, uh, over promoting the coconut product, nor am I necessarily telling a patient to stay away from them. Um, and when I'm working with a patient one-on-one, -on -one, I am looking at what they're eating um, overall and what they're eating, like, on a day-to-day -day basis. So in terms of whether that's coconut oil or a whole milk and a splash of whole milk in their coffee, it's not about that one meal like we were talking about before. Um, it's about what are they eating overall. So if they have a, a diet or an eating pattern that is, you know, pretty low in saturated fat, you know, I'm not going to set, tell them to stop eating that coconut yogurt, for example. Okay, last question um, from Katie. Um, she's interested to hear more of your comments on added sugars, um, as the med diet does seem to contain some bit of sweets as a part of, um, you know, that, that food pyramid. So any comments on added sugars or maybe just sugar in general in the med diet? Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I know you all know this, but I'll just reiterate that we're talking about added sugars here. We're not talking about natural sugars that you find in, in fruit, which for vegetables and other things, you know, like a lot of our patients come to, you know, they think that 
they're, if they eat fruit, they're going to like gain weight and, and have disease, which is crazy. But, um, you know, the, the, the sweet part of the Mediterranean diet is in the tippity top of that pyramid along with the meat. Um, so they're talking like about a, a very, very low amount. Um, and again, you know, at least in our practice, we like to tell patients to be thinking about sort of what they're doing 80% of the time because we don't want to demonize, um, you know, treats and sweets and desserts that, that can totally be a part of a healthy diet. Um, in, you know, a Western eating pattern, it, it, it can be different. And some of you that have traveled or are from to other places or have been or are or are from other areas will maybe be able to relate to this, where there are ways that you can make desserts and sweets that are just not as sweet, but when you have the ultra-processed foods and the convenience foods, they just have a, a really high amount, and that's what you want to look out for more than somebody that's putting a little teaspoon of sugar in their coffee or something, for example, um, especially for those of your patients who have kids and, like, all those little tiny you know, yogurt drinks, you know, you have a very small volume of food um, with a pretty significant amount of grams of sugar. Um, so personally, when I'm working with my patients, I focus more on those sort of ultra processed foods more than I do like, you know, a cake they're having at home or at a birthday or something like that. And I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's that's totally fair. Yep. Excellent. Well, we have come to the top of the hour, and I just want to pause and say thank you for joining us, Christine. There was a lot of excitement about the presentation today, and I just want to thank you for sharing your expertise on this topic. No, oh, thank you, Leslie. That was so much fun. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And, you know, feel free to follow us on, on social, me social media and reach out. Thank you so much. Awesome. So in just 10 short days, you can hardly believe it, we're off to the 2023 Today's Dietitian Spring Symposium in Savannah, Georgia. We hope you'll join us there for the 10th annual Continuing Education and Networking event. There's still time to register. We have individual day passes available if you can't join us for the entire event. Jump on the website, todaysdietitian.com forward slash SS23 to learn more and to sign up. Your attendance certificates are now available to download. You can follow the instructions on the screen or refer to the final slide of the presentation handout for information on how to complete the evaluation and access your certificate. If you did not receive the handouts earlier today, they will be included in the credit claiming email that will get sent out in about an hour or so. For the RDs and DTRs in our audience, when you're recording today's activity in your CDR activity log, be sure you select activity type 102 for activities offered by jointly accredited providers. Fear and competency selection are at your own discretion. And with that, we've come to the end of our webinar. Thanks everyone again for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and a great remainder of the week.